just to calm you down today, no mess, no video, and so on. Just what I promised Heidegger, Foucault, politics, intellectual today, and so on. I like the name Gordon Square, how I put it? I already feel like General Gordon and you, the Mahdi soldiers, and I will honorably die there. No, no, no. Has that be evil, Mahdi Buddhists, or whoever you will be there. Okay, okay, so uh, let me directly go to the point. Because I really want to say some maybe surprising things, starting to show my political cards, like you want them, you will get them. Uh, uh, the commonplace today is that philosophers in politics stand for a catastrophic misfortune. Either they miserably fail, or they succeed and they fail even more. They cause a catastrophe. Plato, we know, sold as a slave, or Plato in power, even worse, a tyrant. The idea, common sense idea, is that philosophers try to impose their abstract notion onto reality, then they rape, violate reality, so no wonder that from Plato to Heidegger, they are basically anti-democratic, except some people claim some empiricists, pragmatists, and so on. But here I would like to introduce the first complication, because even there, I think, the image is much more complex Look at the two great opponents in theory, I mean, Karl Popper and Frankfurt School, Adorno. You know, the big so-called positivism strike, positivism debate. They nonetheless share a fundamental feature. Etienne Balibar, once I was in very friendly polemics with him, he drew my attention to it. Namely, this equation which even people like Derrida, Levinas share with this bunch of totality is totalitarianism, to cut a long story short. That is to say, any pretense in theory to grasp totality, or if you want to put it in more absolute terms precisely, to get a contact with the absolute, absolute truth, divinity, whatever, necessarily leads <coughs> to social practice to some kind of terror, totalitarianism whatsoever. I think this has to be categorically rejected. Not only in the empirical sense, like when you say, but look at Stalin. In effect, he was no dogma, dog, uh, dogmaticist. If you look at what Stalin was doing, he was just ruthlessly using bits of Marxism that he needed for his totally pragmatic purposes. I'm not, I'm not just making the point, the, as it were, empirical ad hominem <coughs> point that totalitarians leaders were just referring to uh, this absolute theory, but in their practice they were ruthlessly pragmatic. I claim that even if you look closely at their theory, it wasn't that. It was, to be slightly cynical, much closer to a certain version of British empiricism. I mean, the basic, if you want to grasp a true Stalin, as it were, you get it when he says everything depends on circumstances, no dogmaticism, utter flexibility, everything changes all the time, and so on. And it's, so it's interesting how, even with Hitler, my problem with Hitler is that, and this is my big debate with some well-known anti-essentialists, whatever you accuse Hitler <laughs> of, he was, uh, what would be the opposition of essentialist, contingent, I mean, Hitler's view was not, I'm simply an instrument of fate, everything is predetermined. No, Hitler's view is, if you really read him, which is a difficult task, Hitler is boring, but uh, it's that uh, uh, history is a meaningless battlefield. Everything depends on contingency. Finally, we all fail. All we can do is heroically insist imposing our will. There is no guarantee of the ultimate outcome. Hitler even was mocking the very idea that humanity, men or humanity in general, can ever dominate nature. Hitler's idea was we are always ultimately losers. It's an open contingent process. So Hitler was, again, absolutely no, no reference to any eternal essence and so on and so on. Uh, so, uh, even on the contrary, I claim, isn't it that often in a concrete situation, it can be that the conting 
contingency view is more progressive. But I think we were too brainwashed by this postmodern deconstructionist who automatically equate, you know, identity, bad, totality, imposed, terror, contingency, multiplicity, negotiation, democracy, dialogue, whatever. <laughs> Look, for example, at the situation in France in the late 18th century. Definitely the royalist conservatives were much more contingency people. Their idea was, this was the whole point, I claim, of the debate between uh, historical right and natural right. <coughs> historical right was basically those who insisted on the right of princes, kings to rule, was basically a contingency right. Was, this is what come out of historical contingency. Don't mess with it because, like we have a vulgar saying in Slovene, probably you have your own version, don't mess too much with shit because it will start to smell bad. That's basically the message you got. But you get my point? It was precisely the revolutionaries who, if anything, were essentialists. Now there are eternal human rights and so on and so on. So, back to my point. Uh, even if we forget all this complexity, the feature to retain is that usually this identification, which again, to get my starting point, Popper to the two as opposed as Karl Popper with his more British empiricist approach, falsification race and so on, and Adorno, they nonetheless share this approach of identity in thought, strong conceptual thought is the theory of, of, of political totalitarianism. Or one can even, and this would be a nice exercise, you remember towards the end, yesterday I was boring you with that fragment of, from Chesterton of how ordinary police looks for criminals who kill blah blah, we are reading sonnets and going to intellectual parties to detect potential crimes. But I think that in a way both Adorno and Popper would have accepted a kind of rewriting of this Chesterton, like ordinary fighters for freedom has to fight real dictators, criminals, we go to read Plato, Rousseau and so on to discern their totalitarian crimes being prepared. I, again, my point is to reject this line. So, when Marxists defend Marx, claiming that his ideas were not faithfully realized, for example, in Stalinism, that Marx was betrayed. Uh, there are two ways that critics of Marxism reply to this. One is a Hegelian motive, which is the repetition of the Hegelian well-known proposition, if the idea is not strong enough to realize itself, so much the worse for the idea itself so that you cannot simply play the ideal against reality. It must have been, you cannot simply say Marx was betrayed. If he was Marx, why not? Because Hegel is quite right here. Marx pretended to grasp the historical totality. And the moment you aim at totality, you cannot say, oh, but it wasn't as I planned. You know, you cannot use empirical facts which disturb your plans as an excuse. But then there is another, more tricky, defense, which you find in true conservatives, who say Marx was betrayed, thanks God, if he were to be realized effectively what he planned, it would have been even much worse than Stalinism. The idea is that if you try to translate into actual social organization, Marxist, not Marxist, Marxist of Marx, vision of society, as that you know, where relations between people are transformed into relations, dominations of things, total transparency, general intellect ruling society, that this would have been even <coughs> worse. And then the usual conservative trick that Heidegger at least was willing to draw consequences of his catastrophic experience and conceded that those who think ontologically, who are ready to grasp the fundamental ontological truth of our time, have to err ontically. This is, I think, the utter, if you want, not so much despair as withdrawal of late Heidegger. He's very clear here. I think that the key political statement of Heidegger is that those who aim, try to get, to approach the, the ontological truth, the basic transcendental coordinates of our time, where we are, have to err ontically. You cannot have it both ways. 
You cannot have your ontological cake and eat it ontically. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, my problem here is that this position is that of wisdom. A wise man knows that one should not enforce reality, that a little bit of corruption is the best defense against big corruption and so on and so on. My problem with this position of wisdom is its formalism. Why? Because I think that the, the weakness of wisdom is that it cannot render problematic the very general field within which it operates. What do I mean by this? For example, one of the wise commonplaces today is the idea of avoiding the extremes. Like, in politics we need neither total state control nor total liberalism individualism. If you have a total state control, then individual initiative is crushed to pawn, we get an enlightened totalitarianism. If, on the other hand, you neglect state control, you don't get the healthcare, social security. So we need the right measure. But a brief philosophical reflection here. You know what's the problem with the right measure? Is that in a certain historical constellation, you always presuppose the right measure. And the true historical change is not a change simply from one extreme to the other, like more state control or whatever, but is a change precisely in what you perceive as the right measure. <coughs> For example, let me give you an example. If you take 18th century debates on the role of women, what would have been their vision? On the one hand, we have guys who think uh, husband is the total master, you can beat wives, they don't, shouldn't be allowed to say anything. Then, for them, the other extreme would have been, oh my God, free love, woman can decide, equality. They would have said, no, that's going too much. So let's have the right measure. Yes, you shouldn't beat your wife, you, but you should nonetheless dominate your wife, but in a benevolent way. You know what I mean? The true historical feminist revolution was that what we experience as the middle, the middle itself shifts. And this is, I think, where wisdom fails. This is the true revolution is not a revolution within a field. So when they say, yes, from a revolution extreme, no, it's the revolution in the very common measure. For example, one way to see the limit of this attitude of wisdom would be, again, my eternal example, but why not? It was one of the big traumas. Uh, Let's say we are in Germany in early 30s. It would be easy to say, on the one hand, the Nazi extreme. Yes, this cannot be true, that the Jews are responsible for all the evil. But on the other hand, there is the Jewish extreme. My God, listen, and all those data are true. I'm consciously provoking here. Uh, it is simply true that, like, 70%, even 80 of lawyers in Berlin in <coughs> early 30s were Jews that 60% of journalists were Jews, and so on and so on. So, you get my point. The attitude of wisdom here would have been, but Jews are always pushing, also pushing it a little bit too far. So let's adopt the middle attitude. Let's not directly crash the Jews, but let's slightly, you know, and so on and so on. But you see the f how utterly disgusting and false this position is. So what all I'm saying here is that there are clearly limits of wisdom. And I cannot develop this now, but my next point here is that this is another of my materialist Christian points. Maybe, again, you can accuse me next uh, Wednesday of being one-sided uh, 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 Western uh, Eurocentrist here, but for me, I have this deep suspicion that, my God, this is horrible what I will say, but to provoke you for next Wednesday, I will say that the only true non-wise religion is for me Christianity. It has this madness that with all other religions, I suspect that ultimately they play the card of wisdom. Which is, you know, ultimately we all die, don't push into extremes and so on. Christianity is for me the religion of one-sidedness. It's no, it's pure one, it's the, the only religion that I know of utter partiality, almost a Stalinist partiality. This is for me the truth of that, you know, uh, I bring sword, not peace, and so on, and so on. It's, truth is on one side, truth is in the extreme. Okay, let's go on. So, where does Lacan stand with regard to all this? A brutal question. Lacan's theory, of course, can be used as a tool to 
throw a new light on numerous political ideological phenomena, bringing to the light hidden libidinal economy of today's liberalism, totalitarianism, whatever you want. But I'm asking here a much more basic and even simple naive question. Does Lacan's theory imply a precise political stance? The attempts to deal with this issue seem to focus around two main versions, if we discount positions which are for me clearly extreme, not in accordance with the letter and the spirit and all of Lacan's thought, like the position defended by otherwise very interesting, he's not stupid, French, Lacanian, half Lacanian, he's drifting now, Pierre Legendre, according to whom the lesson of Lacan today is that all these gay rights, blah, 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 uh, 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 same-sex couples, uh, uh, gay adoption, that this is too much in the sense that it undermines the very symbolic coordinates of our social space. So if we go in this way, it will be a new psychotic totalitarianism. So we need some kind of re-emergence of the symbolic authority. But I think this clearly sticks out. What we have are two versions. One, some Lacanians, but not even exclusively Lacanians. I will name some of them. Ernesto Laclau, <laughs> Chantal Mouffe, uh, their follower who is closer to Lacan, Yanis Stavrakakis and others, try to demonstrate that Lacanian theory can be directly applied, used to ground democratic politics. The terms are well known here. There is no big other. Lacan's notion of the big, the Bart, thwarted, non-existent, inconsistent, whatever you want, symbolic order, means that the social symbolic order is inconsistent. There is no, as Lacan put it, no other of the other, no ultimate guarantee. And the idea is that democracy is the way to integrate into the edifice of power this lack of ultimate foundation. Insofar as all organic visions of a harmonious whole of society rely on a fantasy, democracy thus appears to offer a political stance which traverses fantasy. That's the wager here. Know that what Lacan describes as the most radical experience in the psychoanalytic treatment, the final point when you traverse the fantasy, that is to say, problematize, or rather, experience in its utter meaninglessness and contingency, the very ultimate coordinates, phantasmatic coordinates of your being, of your experience of reality. That their claim is that, the claim of those who pursue this line, that we can produce, generate, practice even, uh, how should I put it, political version of this insight, which is simply radical democracy. Uh, for them to present this logic in a simplified way, fantasy is always fantasy of an organic whole society without antagonism, blah, blah, and democracy precisely renounces this impossible ideal of a non-antagonistic society. The idea is thus that for democracy, for the authentic core of democracy, what for other theories, totalitarian theories, pre-modern theories, is the problem. The fact that you never know who is in power, who is in charge, who is the king. This emptiness, vacillation of power, multiple contenders for power, which, as you know, this was always in pre-modern theories the moment of panic. Here, this is not only allowed, tolerated, but even elevated into the saving feature. That is to say, for, from a democratic perspective, the occasional shake acts are what shake acts in the sense of the shattering of the established social edifice through democratic process, it what makes society function. So democracy elevates incompleteness into principle. It institutionalizes the regular shake up in the guise of election. In short, the Bart S, no, sorry, signifier of the Bart big other, the fact that is, for example, for Miller, the signifier of democracy. So democracy goes here further than the common realistic wisdom according to which in order to actualize a certain political vision, one should allow for concrete, unpredictable circumstances, be ready to make compromises and so on. You get my point. Democracy 
turns imperfection itself into a notion. We, you know all Claude Lefort formulas here, how for democracy the place of power is, uh, is a priori empty, inconsistent, and so on and so on. So we have here this vision. I already criticized this vision in some of my books, even I don't know which one, I think the most expanded version in my uh, Iraq book, The Borrowed Kettle. All I want to tell you is that I find very funny the polemics in which this critique involved me. Because uh, what shocked me a little bit is how those who criticized me either ignored or if they did not ignore treated as a simple regression of my part, an obvious fact, which I openly admit, that I myself, in my early, oh my God, this is so megalomania to say, but early works, <laughs> developed this notion, this notion of democracy as basically something that fits Lacanian logic of non all democracy as the inscription of the inexistence of the big other into the very social order, and so on, and so on. Okay, for reasons we don't have time to go into it now, I no longer buy this version. Then, there are others, other Lacanians, the majority, I would say, who, while retaining a kind of a general liberal attitude, okay, so, but back to my critics, you know what really pisses me off, with them? <laughs> nonetheless, that they simply, I mean, they basically reproach to me my own old quotes, saying, but don't I see that, and what I don't see that, what I was writing 15 years ago, or what. I mean, uh, especially I'm trying to, my God, I'm developing now slowly into a liberal, in the sense that what I really hate is when people use this dirty rhetorical trick in polemics, where, you know, instead of honestly saying, you think this, I think that, they say, I, you don't see what I see. My God, of course I don't see, but so they don't see. You know what I mean? I mean, okay, but let's go on. Uh, nonetheless, the majority of Lacanians, as far as I can say, have a different attitude towards politics. It is the attitude of positing Lacan as an internal critic of democracy, a provocateur who raises, un raises unpleasant questions without proposing his own positive political project. It's just that Lacan is just this kind of a, you know, like Socrates, I think somewhere even in Plato, I forgot where he identified himself as this fly bus who is annoying the organism, but in the long term, this ironic biting serves, helps to regenerate the social order. <laughs> uh, the foundation of this is the another much stronger thesis. It is that and Miller, in his last writings, put it. Uh, incidentally, in his writings, where he, unfortunately, Jacqueline Miller, openly adopts the attitude, which I think, in the best of the terms, could be called some kind of a center-right position, bluntly. That the idea is that politics as such is a domain of imaginary symbolic identification. That Politics involves a kind of a constitutive misrecognition or self-blinding. That is to say, this is precisely the opposite of the position of Stavarkakis and others. It's the opposition that it's meaningless to talk about traversing the fantasy within politics because politics is, the, is a domain of collective acts. And it's basically, I think, the second position, which is why if I were to choose between the two, I would nonetheless choose the first Stavarkakis position. The idea is that Politics as such is a domain, how to put it, ontologically, it's constituted always based on a certain blindness, misrecognition. In the sense of involving fundamental act of imaginary, of symbolic identification. And since the ultimate insight of psychoanalysis is traversing the fantasy as this identification, precisely, you cannot, it's meaningless to ask what would have been a political stance of an analyst, because it, there is none, because the ultimate stance of an analyst is precisely a distance, a disidentification with the political domain as such. Now, if you ask me as an old Stalinist, 
What do I think about this? Of course, my first answer is that this position says more than it intends to say, because I claim that precisely such a distance towards politics is involves a very precise political attitude. Usually, let's call it by name uh, uh, liberal, rightist, individualist, whatever, you know, this kind of a skepticism, which in practice means kind of a moderate, pragmatic politics, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Lacan as a provocateur, in the line from Socrates to Kierkegaard. Lacan as the one who discerns democracy's, democracy's illusions, hidden metaphysical presuppositions, but should not be taken. It's a kind of a a priori, almost Kantian criticism of Lacan. It's a, in the sense that this position locates a legitimate. Lo, what what is the this, uh, the underlying premise of this attitude that all radical thinkers, from Plato to to Lacan, Nietzsche, whoever you want, uh, should be tolerated within their own domain? Is this provocateurs? Uh, making us aware of the limitations of our position, but I'm consciously putting it here in Kantian terms. If you go too far and read this negative critique as a positive constitutive project, as a project to be enacted in social reality, it's a catastrophe. It's totalitarianism, racism, whatever you want. Like Nietzsche. Good Nietzsche cultural criticism, you know, ironic... Uh, denouncing of the falsity, hypocrisy of our morality, blah, blah, blah. But the moment you take Nietzsche as a program, it's nightmare. It's Nazism or whatever. The one who elaborated this position in, as far as I know, you may correct me if I'm wrong, in the most articulate way is uh, Wendy Brown. In her book, which I advise you to read it. It's, I think it's called, uh, is it Politics Out of History? I think it's Politics Out of History. Okay. I know, now don't laugh at me, I know she is not Lacanian. But I think that her criticism of, her, her <coughs> approach to public position of critical intellectuals is extremely important. Uh, Brown reads the postmodern politics of identity based on the wrongs committed to special groups along the sex, gender, race line as an expression of the ambiguous relationship one entertains towards the good old liberal democratic egalitarian frame of human rights. One feels betrayed by it with regard to women, blacks, gays, the universal liberal rhetoric didn't deliver. It masks continuous exclusion and exploitation. But one nonetheless remains deeply attached to these liberal ideals. A short quote from page 28. Yes, it's, sorry, Politics Out of History, Princeton University Press, 2001. It's, uh, it is when the telos of the good vanishes, liberal democratic good, but the yearning for it remains that morality appears to devolve into moralism in politics, end of quote. So, after the disintegration of the large, all-encompassing leftist narratives of progress, when political activity dissolved into a multitude of identity issues, the excess over these particular struggles can only find an outlet in impotent moralistic outrage. I basically accept this analysis. However, Wendy Brown makes a crucial step further and deploys the paradoxes of democracy to the end. According to her, Spinoza, Tocqueville, and other immanent critics of democracy were right. Democracy is in itself, in court, empty, lacking a firm principle. It needs anti-democratic content to fill in its form. As such, it is really constitutively formal. This anti-democratic content is provided by philosophy, theology, theory. No wonder that most of the great philosophers from Plato to Heidegger were distrustful towards democracy, if not directly anti-democratic. Another quote from Wendy Brown, page 122. What if democratic politics, 
the most untheoretical of all political forms, paradoxically requires theory, requires an antithesis to itself in both the form and substance of theory, if it is to satisfy its ambition to produce a free and egalitarian order." End of quote. So Brown deploys all the paradoxes from the fact that democracy requires for its health a non-democratic element. Ironically, I'm tempted to refer to this as a homeopathic theory of, uh, for obvious reasons, of democracy. In order to remain a vital democracy, democracy needs a permanent influx of anti-democratic self-questioning. So again, the cure for democracy's ills is homeopathic. Another quote, page 128. If, as the musings of Spinoza and Tocqueville suggest, democracies tend towards cathexis onto principles antithetic to democracy, then critical scrutiny of these principles and of the political formations animated by them is crucial to the project of refounding on recovering democracy. End of quote. I got the point, but I think here we can uh, perceive the first crack in her edifice. Because first her idea was that democracy is in itself uh, impossible to fill it in, gets ossified to fill in its own content, so it needs a critical anti-democratic influx. Now we learn that democracy tends towards cathexis on principle and, and that, that the critical scrutiny is, how to put it, against anti-democratic elements in democracy. Okay, but more about this later. Let's return to Wendy Brown. So she defines the tension between politics and theory democratic politics and contemporary theories as the tension between, and here problems for me begin, as the tension between the political necessity to fixate meaning, to suture the textual drift in a form principle which can only guide us in action, the tension between this and between theories permanent deconstruction which cannot ever be recuperated in a new positive program. The point is, I think, even very banal. In order to be operative in politics, you should forget about deconstruction. You need fixed goals, simple slogans, and so on, and so on. And on the other hand, theory is basically destructive undermining, deconstructing, and so on. And there is a tension between the two. Another quote. Among human practices, politics is peculiarly untheoretical because the bits for power that constitute it are necessarily at odds with the theoretical project of opening up meaning, of making meaning slide. slide. Discursive power functions by concealing the terms of its fabrication and hence its malleability and contingency. Discourse fixes meaning by naturalizing it, or else ceases to have sway as a discourse. This fixing or naturalizing of meanings is the necessary idiom in which politics takes place. Incidentally, with this I violently disagree. I Continue the quote, even the politics of deconstructive displacement implicates such normativity, at least provisionally. End of quote. So the idea is that theoretical analysis which unearth the contingent and inconsistent nature or a lack of ultimate foundation of all normative constructs and political projects are anti-political endeavors insofar as each destabilizes meaning without proposing alternative codes or institutions. Yet each may also be essential in sustaining an existing democratic regime by rejuvenating it. That's what, in when I will be in power, you go, when you get 20 years of gulag without, <laughs> what do you call it? Without then, when there is, what's the legal term, sorry, when there is no chance of lowering it, without, uh, no, yeah, no probation, why? Right. Uh, again, you got the point. The point is this very naive democratic, uh, sorry, deconstructionist idea that in order to be politically active, we need minimum of naturalization, fixation, 
which is inherently anti-theoretical, because theory precisely shows the contingent foundation of every meaning, and so on and so on. So the tension is irreducible, because on the other hand, on this, with this deconstructive endeavor, you cannot found any politics, any positive politics. Where do I see problems here? In her further analysis, Wendy Brown attributes the same ambiguous, why I'm fixing on her, because, again, I really appreciate her. I think that she dared to bring out into the open the implicit presupposition, almost, of the hegemonic attitude among postmodern intellectuals, and so on and so on. Brown attributes the same ambiguous link also to the relationship between state and people. In the same way that democracy needs anti-democracy to rejuvenate itself, state needs people's resistance to rejuvenate itself. Another quote, this time page 137. Only through the state are the people constituted as a people. Only in resistance to the state do the people remain a people. Thus, just as democracy <coughs> requires anti-democratic critique in order to remain democratic, so too the democratic state may require you note the revisionist Menshevik withdrawal, may require, she is. In the trial against her, it will be the next. The, my dream would be not if Moscow trials were against politicians. What if, with Costas, we are trying to establish a kind of a think tank of the new left, we should organize London trials now, <laughs> intellectual trials. <laughs> uh, just as democracy requires, uh, so, uh, so too. The democratic state may require democratic resistance rather than rather if it is not to become the death of democracy. Similarly, democracy may require theories provision of unlivable critiques and unreachable ideas. So you got the point. It's this simple transgressive model. You should be a provocateur, make it move, but don't go too far. Okay, here I think things explode for me into serious questions. In this parallel between the two couples of democracy, anti-democracy and state people, I think that Wendy Brown's argumentation gets caught in a strange dynamic of reversals. First she claims democracy needs anti-democratic critique to remain alive, to shaken its false certainties. That was the first thesis. No? The big philosophers, you remember, from Plato to Heidegger, Nietzsche, mock democracy, but let's not be afraid of it. What appears as a threat is really a rejuvenating cure. But then, she claims, the democratic state needs democratic resistance of the people. Wait a minute. Where is the parallel? Why not it needs anti-democratic resistance? Does Brown not confound here two, or rather, a whole series of resistances to democratic state. We have the anti-democratic elitist theoreticians resistance, the Plato, Nietzsche, Heidegger line. We have the popular democratic resistance against the insufficiently democratic character of the state, and so on and so on. Furthermore, is not each of these two resistances accompanied by its dark, shadowy double? The brutal, cynical elitism that justifies those in power, or the violent outbursts of a rebel. And what if the two join hands? You got my point. That, uh, okay, we have, like, uh, what Wendy Brown celebrates as this Nietzsche, Heidegger line of uh, provocative rejuvenating of democracy. Yes, but the problem is that this provocative reju re rejuvenating attitude was sometimes taken very seriously. No? What if it doesn't want to stay provocative rejuvenating critique and what if these guys get in power, my God? No? So, you know, the true heroism of Wendy Brown, and here I will do something that you will kill me afterwards, but to do it out of pure viciousness. Maybe as a woman she is too soft to say it. Okay, I say it. <laughs> For her would be, you know where her logic should have bring her? To claim what if Hitler was the ultimate rejuvenating force of democracy? And I'm sorry to inform you, but he was in a way. Are we aware that all our, here I give 
pay the due what they deserve to third way social democracy. My God, I mean, with all my radical criticism of them, let's be frank. After World War II, the social welfare project was something, and I don't have any illusions, I wrote about it, but let's admit it, I will say something horrible if you are a radical leftist. <clears throat> I don't think that at any point in not only Western but even human history, this is what is important, <laughs> the state power itself accepted, not only as a mercy benevolence of the ruler, but accepted, even if it violated it in practice, accepted as its founding principle that it is here to secure the majority, health care, school, this egalitarian openness. I mean, you know, with all my cynicism and Stalinist leadings, uh, leanings, we shouldn't make fun of it. I mean, I'm here very traditional. And don't accuse me of becoming a liberal. Don't be afraid. But there is something normatively unique here. As far as I can say, for the first time in human history, this happened. No? Sorry? First? You mean first 20 years of in... Where was this? In... Okay, no, I... Again, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to go into... Uh, Islam, because first, as I already emphasized it, but don't be afraid, you already, I will not now go into another version of Buddhism and have no, I fully admit it, because I, as I tried to develop in my text, my God, I am aware that where I see the unique potential of Islam, again, what I emphasize, two things. First, uh, uh, non in contrast to Christianity and Judaism, non-paternal. The fundamental position of Islam believer is an orphan. And not only in orphan, in this Christian trick, we are earthly orphans so that you get the true big death in God. No, in a way you remain an orphan. It's not just an empirical feature that, for example, okay, now I'm talking about Arabs more specifically, but that, you know, Ishmael is the original one, is the son of Hagar. They clearly opt for the, and I'm using here the term without irony, for a, uh, how do you call that? Self-employed single mother. No, is the is the literally the primor. You know the sto you know the story, which is the Arab myth that you know, you know Abraham, two wives, two sons. No, and it's the other one which is, and this the other thing connected to it is precisely. This is why I think Islam has such problems with femininity. It's the other, the obverse of a hidden narrative of much stronger reliance of femininity. You know, we should be a little bit analysts here. When you have such fear of covering women, women all the time, I would like to know what woman is that. And I think that implicitly they construct a much stronger person of the woman. Like, are you aware that in Mohammed's story itself, there is woman is the big other. You know the story of his wife, Kadiyah, who was the first believer. Maybe I improvised it here. You know that when Mohammed got his visions, no, he thought he's getting crazy. It's devil. And then his wife was the first one who convinced him and so on and so on and so on. Back to that orphanage story. Because of this, I think you have this tremendous political potential in Islam. Because the problem of Islam, even if it may sound different, is precisely, this is the famous Uma, not something Uma as community of believers. It's the problem is the tremendous one, and crucial even today, how to build a community without relying on any pre-established patriarchal order or whatever. But, so that nonetheless I don't lose my thread, agreeing with all this, I'm nonetheless a little bit afraid to pose this kind of a direct equation between modern notion of welfare state and, again, conceding all the points, which is A, they were, for that time, incredibly progressive. It was something unheard of, and so on, and so on. I concede all this, but nonetheless, okay, I would be a little bit afraid to... I, okay, I even give you this point, that they are probably the ones who come the closest to it, how should I put it? The closest in the sense that you cannot even compare it with... Uh, it's as if in early Islamic community, something of the emancipatory potential of early Christian communities 
this Polinian community of believers, which was then screwed up, if no later, by St. Augustine, which is why I love Fred Jensen's text, which I published in my volume on St. Augustine as the original social democrat. You know, it's an ingenious thesis by Fred Jensen. You know what it is that, in that, that structurally St. Augustine plays the same role in Christianity as a revolutionary movement early as American renegades in the 50s did. That is to say, this, this criticism, bourgeois of Marxism, claiming leftism is too simplistic, usually with some reference of psychoanalysis, you know, all the partisan review story. We have to discover inner life. This, you, the reference to inner life to betray your radical leftist cause. This is exactly what Augustine did. He discovered inner life, which is for Fred Jameson strictly a social democratic revisionism in the sense that in this way he was able to make compromise with those in power. No? That is to say, this is what I like in this thesis, that uh, this so celebrated inner doubt, all this inner film that it evokes my dirtiest Stalinist instinct. In St. Augustine, all this inner blah, blah, this is strictly the obverse of his uh, crucial push of Christianity into becoming the state religion. And I'm ready to concede that some of this impetus, you definitely have it in... Uh, in, uh, in uh, no, but, but, I, okay, but let's not get lost in it. Okay, let's go back. So let's go back where we were, and we were with this contradiction of contradiction in Wendy Brown's line of uh, argumentation. How, on the one hand, yes, we have the that this <laughs> critique that he celebrates as rejuvenating can not only become an ideology of those in power but can also be used as the brutal, cynical elitism that justifies those in power. Like, you know, I'm getting a little bit tired with all my love of Nietzsche, of those who present Nietzsche as some kind of a radical, outcast, critical figure. I mean, screw it. Nietzsche was, uh, in the last decades when he was already crazy, he was an extremely popular cult figure among German youth conservatives and so on. And again, as I already said here, it pisses me off when my poor beloved guys like Wagner, every detail when they, when you can detect some kind of anti-Semitism, deconstructionist, pick it up. But if you read Foucault, if you read Deleuze on Nietzsche, my God, where is Nietzsche's politics? You don't even have to deconstruct it. Nietzsche all the time was taking explicit political stance when Nietzsche spoke about the rebellion of slaves as the ultimate horror that threat. He, it wasn't an abstract phrase. It meant Paris Commune. Because as a good conservative, you know, Nietzsche believed that the rumors, that there was a rumor circulating that, 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 uh, that the Paris Communards were, were burning Louvre Museum or whatever. Oh, Nietzsche immediately, of course. Be so, you know, like, all this disappears from Nietzsche. Nietzsche was not a marginal figure in the sense of crazy lunatic. Already before Hitler, Nietzsche was the, one of the key elements in state, was practically a state philosopher, if you want. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is, what about the violent outbursts of a rabble, of a mob? In other words, what about the paradox? This would be the true democracy, I claim. The paradox that there are situations, I can well imagine them, in which an authentic democrat can say, now we are facing blind obedience to ossified, alienated rules and popular will. But I stick to rules, crush them with police and so on. Sorry, but for me, there are situations where when crowds are mobilized for a reactionary cause, where I, where I would be absolutely for use the police, crush them brutally, whatever you want. So, uh, and again, what about the idea that the two resistances join hands? What about anti-democratic resistance of the people themselves, authoritarian populism? Furthermore, does Brown not dismiss all too lightly, again, I'm restating my point, sorry, the anti-democratic theorists like Nietzsche as proposing unlivable critiques of democracy? 
But wait a minute, Nietzsche didn't propose an unlivable critique of democracy. Okay, we can play again the games as with Marx, did the Nazis really realize Nietzsche? But at least it was not unlivable in the sense that we have an actual political movement which exerted its brutal power, legitimizing itself to a large extent with a reference to Nietzsche. Of course, they did distort Nietzsche, but so did Stalinism distort Marx. So did every theory change, or if you want, was betrayed in its practical political um, uh, application. The weakness of Brown's description is perhaps that she locates the undemocratic ingredient that keeps democracy alive only in crazy theoreticians questioning its foundations from unlivable premises. But what about the very real undemocratic elements that sustain democracy? I think that it's, I found it a nice paradox how, although Foucault is Wendy Brown's main reference, how she doesn't, she doesn't mention here Foucault. The way I read Foucault's analysis of modern power is precisely this. It's not some crazy rejuvenating critiques, is that there is a non-democratic institutionalized core which is necessary for the effective functioning of modern democracy. Democratic power has to be sustained by a complex network of controlling, regulating, non-democratic regulating mechanisms. In his notes towards a definition of culture, T.S. Eliot, I think, convincingly argued that a strong aristocratic class is a necessary ingredient of a feasible democracy. The highest cultural values can only thrive if they are transmitted through a complex, continuous familial group background. So when Brown claims that democracy requires anti-democratic critique in order to remain democratic, a liberal conservative would deeply agree and would say, but this is what we are saying today when we warn against what American conservatives calls, call democracy, like more, too much democracy. There should be a tension in the opposition between state and democracy. A state should not simply be dissolved in democracy. It should retain an excess of unconditional power over the people, a firm rule of law to prevent its own dissolution. If the state, democratic as it is, is not sustained by this specter of the unconditional exercise of power, it does not have the power, the authority to function. Power is by definition an excess, otherwise it is not power. Now we may not disagree with it, but I think it's a fact that in order for us to accept power, state power, seriously, it must have this excess. It must have this superego message between the lines, yeah, 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 you elect me, but Fuck you. In, at the ultimately, I can do whatever I want. I mean, I'm not making fun here. I think that this is not just an excess. It's a constitutive excess. You need it. Uh, furthermore, apropos, and here I think she is triumphantly wrong, Wendy Brown. Apropos stopping the sliding of meaning. The idea that politics need this stupid fixated meaning while we deconstructionist uh, undermine slight meaning and so on. But wait a minute, does not, does non-democratic theory as a rule not articulate its horror at democracy precisely because it perceives it as too much sliding of meaning, as too sophistic, too involved in sliding of meaning. So the theory, far from reproaching democracy for the fixity of meaning, desperately wants to impose a stable order on social life. Again, if you read all great conservatives to which she refers, from Plato through Nietzsche to Heidegger, my God, it's not democracy is too fixed and we want to deconstruct free floating. No, it's democracy is too sophistic floating, we want firm principles, order and so on. <laughs> Furthermore, is this incessant sliding of meaning not something that is already a feature of capitalist economy itself, which, in its contemporary dynamic, raises to a new degree Marx's old motto of dissolving all fixed identities. So, this homeopathic logic evoked by Wendy Brown is, I think, deeply ambiguous. 
the remedy against ossified state democracy is external theoretical anti-democratic critique which shatters its certainties and rejuvenates it. But at the same time, there is opposite homeopathy. As the same goes, the only true remedy against the obvious democratic failures is more of democracy itself. And all dangers that lurk in democracy can be developed, I think, as grounded in these constitutive inconsistencies of the democratic project, as ways of dealing with these inconsistencies, with the price that, in trying to get rid of the imperfections of democracy, of its non-democratic ingredients, we inadvertently lose democracy, democracy itself. So, I think that Wendy Brown is effectively all too non-Nietzschean in her reduction or even domestication of Nietzsche to a provocative correction to democracy, which, through his exaggeration, renders visible the inconsistencies, weaknesses of the democratic project. Again, when she proclaims Nietzsche's implicit or explicit anti-democratic project unlivable, she thereby all too glibly passes over the fact that there were very real political projects which directly referred to Nietzsche. Brown thus, I think, accomplishes the domestification of Nietzsche, the transformation of his theory into an exercise in what I call inherent transgression, provocations which are not really meant seriously, which only aim through their provocative character to awaken us from the democratic dogmatic slumber and thus contribute to the revitalization of democracy itself. This is how the establishments liked subversive theorists to be, turned into harmless gadflies who bite us and thus awaken us up to our inconsistencies and imperfections. God forbid us to take their project seriously and try to leave their project. Again, I think that the model that Wendy Brown proposes is precisely part of this postmodern wisdom that we should avoid. Against her, I am tempted to ruthlessly assert precisely the Heidegger, which many people consider the most problematic Heidegger, the brutal Heidegger of the early 30s, the Heidegger who heroically risked full engagement. I agree with Fred Jameson, who says that Heidegger's Nazi engagement was the only really sympathetic thing that he did. He only did it in the right direction, but it was a correct formal act. What do I mean by this? Ah, now you will get your political stuff. I want to take as a starting point Heidegger's thesis, <coughs> developed already in 2930, and then repeated at least till 46, 47, that terror, Schrecken, and by terror, he uses here this important <coughs> thing, although we don't have time to go into it, terror, not, uh, not angst, not anxiety. Terror is necessary if the modern man is to be awakened from his metaphysical technological slumber into what Heidegger calls a new beginning. What does he mean by this? Let me give you a nice quote, which I totally subscribe. We must principally concern ourselves with preparing for man, for humanity, the very basis and dimension upon which and within which something like a mystery of his Design, design, the answer could once again be encountered. We should not be at all surprised if the contemporary man in the street feels disturbed or perhaps sometimes dazed and clutches all the more stubbornly at his idols when confronted with this challenge and with the effort required to <coughs> approach this mystery. It would be a mistake to expect anything else. We must first call for someone capable of instilling terror into our design again. End of quote. That's where I feel at home. What did this mean? So Heidegger opposes wonder as the basic disposition of the first Greek beginning. You know, for Heidegger, the original philosophical mood is wonder, wonder and how is it there are beings and so on, to terror as the basic disposition of our, maybe if we have a chance of its second new beginning. Another quote. In wonder, the basic disposition of the first beginning, beings first come to stand in their own. Terror, the basic disposition of the other beginning, reveals behind all progress and all domination over beings a dark emptiness of 
irrelevance. Now, what I'm saying before we dismiss this as proto-fascist terrorism and so on and so on, is that basically Hegel and Marx were saying the same thing. First Hegel. You remember one of the most famous Hegelian passages from his analysis of master and servant, bondsman. I will not go into this Hegelian topic, how to translate the term. When Hegel emphasized how, now listen carefully, please, because it's relatively complex. Since the bondsman, okay, the servant, is also a self-consciousness, freedom, negativity, now quote fr from the uh, uh, introduction, sorry, no, from the forward to phenomenology, the master is taken to be the essential reality for the state of bondage. I will try to comment it to avoid misunderstanding. So, you are a bondsman, you experience yourself as servant, not autonomous, so the foundation of your being is outside of you, in the figure of your master. Hence, for the servant, the truth is the independent consciousness existing for itself, although this truth is not taken yet as inherent in bondage itself. What he means is that, in some ways, the servant is already aware that the true core of being human is this, readiness to uh, expose yourself to, to terror, to risk your life, where all firm attachments, all fixed identity dissolves. Just in the first move, the bondsman is not ready to take it on himself, but he has it out there. That's what master is for him. Still, I continue Hegel's quote, still it does in fact contain the consciousness of the bondsman, of the servant, it does in fact contain within itself this truth of pure negativity and self-existence because it has experienced this reality within it. For this consciousness, the consciousness of the servant, was this consciousness not in peril and fear for this moment, for this, sorry, for the consciousness of the servant, was not in peril and fear for this moment or that moment nor for this or that moment of time. It was afraid for its entire being when it faced being annihilated by the master. It felt the fear of death, the sovereign master. It has been in that experience, this fear was in that experience melted to its servant's innermost soul. It has trembled throughout its every fiber. And all that was fixed and steadfast has quaked within it. You know, a retroactive quote from Communist Manifesto and so on. This complete perturbation of one's entire substance, this absolute dissolution of all our stability into fluent continuity, is, however, the simple ultimate nature of self-consciousness. Absolute negativity, pure self-referent existence, which consequently is involved in this type of consciousness. This moment of pure self-existence is moreover a fact for it, for the servant. For in the master it finds this as its object. Further, this servant's consciousness is not only the total, this total dissolution in a general way. In serving and toiling, the servant actually carries this out. By serving, he cancels in every particular aspect his dependence on and attachment to natural existence, and by his work removes this natural existence away. So, you got the point of Hegel, it's a very simple one, is that even if servant doesn't risk his life, he nonetheless in itself already does it. In the very fear of risking his life, he experiences this radical exposure, negativity, as his freedom, which is still out there, but then, okay, you know how the dialectic goes on. What I want to say now, another provocation, is that this is, I think, how, again, a theological detour, how we should read encounter with freedom. And I think even in this sense, I'm tempted to say, within a religious framework, Christ's sacrifice sets us free, not as the payment for our sins, nor as some kind of legalistic ransom, but remember, like when we are afraid of something, and fear of death is the ultimate fear that makes us slaves. A true friend says, 
Don't be afraid. Look, I will do it. What you are afraid, so afraid of, and I will do it for free. Not because I have to, but out of my own love for you. I am not afraid. He does it, and in this way, he sets us free, demonstrating that it can be done, that we can also do it, that we are not slaves. It is shock when you encounter somebody who simply can do it. Now, I'll give an example to shock you. You think I cannot fall lower than what I did? I can. <laughs> and rent the fountain bed. It's the lowest. But I was always fascinated by the final, this, you know, it's this ultimate liberal, uh, I mean, individualist, heroic architect, Howard Rourke, who defends his position at the end in front of the jury and convinces them. Uh, and they are, of course, the ordinary men enslaved. And how do they, the jury, in the courtroom experienced him. A quote. Rourke stood before them as each man stands in the innocence of his own mind. But Rourke stood like that before a hostile crowd, and they knew suddenly that no hatred was possible to him. For the flash of an instant, they grasped the manner of his, Rourke's, consciousness. Each asked himself, do I need anyone's approval? Does it matter? Am I tired? And for that brief instant, each man was free, free enough to feel benevolence for every other man in the room. It was only a moment, the moment of silence when Rourke was about to speak, and so on, and so on. Whatever fake Ayn Rand is, I claim this is an authentic, I claim this is an authentic description. So, my first thesis, Heidegger, Hegel, Marx, because I think that to experience this kind of a terror of dissolution, this is what Marx calls the, pro the proletarian experience, I'm sorry to inform you. It's precisely this utter void when all substantial links are dissolved. So, my first thesis, we do need, and we will get it, don't worry about it, this experience of terror. Next thesis, I think that the true choice, political choice today, is not between terror, fear, and so on, and on the other hand, safety, welfare, the true choice is between fear and terror. What do I mean by this? Today's predominant mode of politics, the, I've, I've talked about it I, enough elsewhere, I will presuppose that you know it. The post-political biopolitics is fundamentally a politics of fear, formulated as a defense against a potential victimization or harassment. As Peter Holward pointed out, the, you know him, I hope, the one of the three, four people who interest me theoretically in United Kingdom today. Uh, <laughs> this is the true line of separation between radical emancipatory politics and the predominant status quo politics. It is not a difference of two different positive visions, two sets of axioms, but rather the difference between the politics based on a set of universal axioms and the politics which renounces the very dimension of the political, since it resorts to fear as its ultimate mobilizing principle. Fear of immigrants, fear of crime, fear of godless sexual depravity, fear of the excessive state with too high taxation and so on, fear of economic decline, fear of ecological catastrophes and so on and so on. To quote Peter Colbert, such a post-politics always relies on the manipulation of a paranoid oculus, the frightening rallying of frightened men, end of quote. This is why, if you ask me what was the big event, not only in Europe in early 2006 now, uh, but also elsewhere, was that, and it happened very silently, it was rarely noticed, was that anti-immigration politics, and I think it's one of the privileged politics of fear today, went mainstream. They finally cut the umbilical link that connected them to the far-right fringe parties, from France to Germany, from Austria to Holland. In the new spirit of pride at one's cultural and historical identity, the main parties now find it acceptable to stress that the immigrants are guests who have to accommodate themselves to the cultural values that define the host society it is. Our country, love it or leave it, and so on and so on. Now, what I'm saying is just that this is a further victory for the politics of fear. And this, I think, accounts for the fundamental 
tension within today's biopolitics. Today's biopolitics has two aspects which may appear as belonging to two opposite ideological spaces. On the one hand, this homo sacer, as Agamben would have put it, aspect, reduction of humans to bear life, humans reduced to disponible objects of the expert caretaking knowledge. On the other hand, this extreme individualism, respect for the vulnerable other, brought to extreme. The attitude of narcissistic subjectivity, always threatened, exposed to harassment, potential victim. Now, one will say, isn't there a contrast here? On the one hand side, we are objects of biopolitics. On the other hand, we are afraid of being victimized. But what I claim is that these two stances rely on the same root. They are the two aspects of one and the same underlying attitude. Which is because the goal of biopolitics is precisely to relieve us of the fear, as it were, to secure our identity, uh, our safe sense, uh, to relieve us from the horror, <coughs> terror, sorry, that we should go through. Uh, of course, again, this experience of horror we know was articulated, <coughs> famous definition of Marx, of the impact of capitalism, you know the quotes, all fixed, fixed, fast frozen relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices are swept away, all new formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify, all that is solid melts into air, and so on and so on. What I'm saying here is that not only Marx was right, but the things are maybe only today with biogenetics and so on, and new social dynamics, approaching the true climax, which even Marx, okay, it's a stupid historicist thing to say, why should he, wasn't able to, to imagine, no? And incidentally, this is where I like Marx, what makes his, him human. Like this absolutely dirty, incredible, sometimes even racist, homophobic outbursts, which simply makes him, my God, now I will sound disgusting, a human man. Like, it's so wonderful to read when they had the split in German social democracy with Ferdinand LaSalle. You know what Marx writes to Engels? That LaSalle, who was also a Jew, had a dark complexion. And Marx involves in a totally crazy racist speculation that probably he must be a, like, grand-grand-grandson of some Jewish whore who, while they were escaping the Jews from Egypt, ran back and screw with some Egyptian or black slave and so on. It's total madness, no, I mean. But you know what's the point? The point is that the greatness was not in Marx's private character. It was in the theory. We have to don't have to repress this. We have to accept it that Marx gave us tools to make fun of Marx in this way, but not, not, to, not to cover this up. OK. Uh, so what we have today, not only that this, all that is solid melt, melts into air at a personal level, sexual practices and so on, whatever you want. The ultimate element here, I think, is, which was not imaginable for Marx, the melting into air of nature itself. I think that the main consequence of the scientific breakthrough in biogenetics is not, as people usually claim, the end of humanity, in the sense of we will just become a disponible, another natural object. But it's, on the contrary, the end of nature. Once we know the rules of its construction, natural organisms are transformed into objects amenable to manipulation. Nature, human and inhuman, is thus desubstantialized, deprived of its impenetrable density, deprived of what Heidegger called Earth. Biogenetics, with its reduction of the human psyche itself to an object of technological manipulation, is therefore a kind of empirical instantiation of what Heidegger perceived as the danger inherent to modern technology. And again, crucial is here, I think, the interdependence of man and nature by reducing man to just another natural object whose properties can be manipulated. Again, what we lose is not humanity, but nature itself. In this sense, maybe Fukuyama was right. Humanity itself relies on some notion of 
human nature as what we inherited or what was simply given to us. The impenetrable dimension of ourselves into which we are thrown. So, you know, my point being that we are human in the sense we understand it only against the background of this impenetrability, natural impenetrability. Once the end of humanity in this sense, human being becomes something totally uh, uh, technologically that can be in principle manipulated and so on and so on, is <coughs> at the same time the end of nature. Nature becomes just another artificial mechanism. So, uh, we know what's the formula here. With the prospect of biogenetic interventions, open up by the access to the genome, the species, human species, can freely change or redefine itself, its own coordinates. So, biogenetics potentially emancipates humankind from the constraints of a finite species, from its uh, enslavement to its own genes. And, let me quote you again the famous passage where Habermas formulated the danger the way he sees it. Quote, with interventions into man's genetic inheritance, the domination over nature reverts into the act of taking control over oneself, which changes our genetic, generic ethical self-understanding and can disturb the necessary conditions for an autonomous way of life and universalistic understanding of morals and so on and so on. I agree, but what I'm saying is that Habermas does not take this threat seriously enough. Okay, the first point which I already developed here, but I think not here, here, but here in that talk where only 20 people came because it was that uh, public talk, no? Is how... <laughs> I would just to repeat this point which seems to me crucial. How? What's so revolutionary about today's science is that it no longer only tries to reproduce nature. It literally generates a second nature, new unnatural mechanisms, like not only hybrid species of animals, sorry, of, uh, of, of plants, of animals, and so on and so on. So, and this is, I think, the true horror, this producing of new forms of life. Uh, and uh, it's here we confront what is the most fundamental in the ecological problem. And I find it so interesting how and why now, precisely when we should think more about it, ecology has, okay, at least relatively disappeared, retreated. Uh, of course, I am aware how ecology is also a pseudo topic, one of the great sites of mystification today. Not only a site of the New Age mystification, ecology is returning to some uh, homo, uh, 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 to some uh, 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 homeostatic <coughs> balance with nature, but also the way ecology is often used as a refined tool of the first world to fight against third world. Like we always need a. Uh, Whenever a third world country's country is starting to explode economically, all of a sudden we feel threatened. Like Brazil, oh my God, by cutting the rainforest in Amazonia, they're depriving humanity of, of their lungs, of their... Well, I mean, I'm sorry to tell you, but the United States still spend much more pollute per capita, so why don't they... Okay, if they worry so much about forests, why don't they plant? I mean, it's ridiculous. Or China today. Oh, it will be a catastrophe and so on and so on. Then, no wonder that ecology is uh, the, fa the favorite cause of honor of liberal communists. Buy, but buy green, natural, sustainable, and so on and so on. As if taking into account ecology justifies uh, exploitation. And what really I find so sometimes tragicomic in ecology is how the most radical ecology can copy, repeat the worst of what it, think, of what it thinks that it undermines, technological attitude. <coughs> because, look, here is a quote from a Heideggerian, I think Mark Rathol. Uh, in the technological age, what matters to us most is getting the greatest possible use out of everything. Now, it is supposed to criticize this technological attitude of utilizing, but wait a minute, don't we call this ecological recycling? 
which is precisely this. So you see what I mean, how a Heideggerian would have said that true ecological attitude is not this recycle, use everything. This is precisely technological ecology. True ecology is, yes, there must be unaccounted for shit everywhere, and you have to accept it. True ecology is precisely not this close circle of everything should be, uh, max uh, should be maximized. Where Heidegger can be of some use, and don't be afraid, I will criticize Heidegger later, in ecology is, I think that, you know, Heidegger's, oh my God, I will use stupid terms, but nonetheless, vision of the world, as our experience of being in the world, torn or we are located in the tension between what Heidegger calls world and earth. World as the symbolic universe, logos of meaning, earth as its imponderable, dense, ground for, with self-withdrawing foundation. But do not find, do, do we not find this tension between light world and that heavy density of earth? Do, do we not find it today in the most radical way in the antinomy that defines our experience? On the one hand, there is the fluidification, volatilization of our experience. It's desubstantialization. This exponentially exploding lightness of being culminates, of course, in the cyber dream of the transformation of our very identity as a human being from hardware to software, a program able to be reloaded from one to another hardware. Reality is here virtualized. Any failure can be undone by running back and making another try at it. That's one aspect. Now, this virtualization, everything can be recreated, infinite plasticity of reality. However, this virtualized world in which we dwell is threatened by the shadow of what we usually designate as the prospect of ecological catastrophe. The imponderable heaviness and complexity, the inertia of Earth catching up, reminding us of the fragile equilibrium which forms the background foundation of our survival on Earth. And that we can inadvertently destroy, of course, through global warming, new viruses, whatever. Never in the history of humanity, I think, was the tension so palpable between the unbearable likeness of our being, media providing us with strangest sensations through a click and so on and so on, and the unpredictable background of Earth. Even at the level of our experience of reality, industrial reality, did you notice how, on the one hand, we have all this idea today, material production no longer matters, it's informal production, virtual programming, blah, blah, blah. But wait a minute, material production doesn't matter, but at the same time, we worry all the time uh, what, what to do with the toxic remainders, ecology, and so on and so on. So it doesn't matter, but it's here more and more as the problem. So what is the interest of Heidegger here? I think the interest of Heidegger is that he's able to show how, where the danger is. For Heidegger, the notion of danger inscribed into modern technology is not primarily the danger of physical self-destruction, the threat that something will go wrong. For Heidegger, it's precisely the threat that nothing will go wrong, that genetic manipulation will function smoothly, so that we will simply follow this path to the end. So, uh, here I think we should follow Heidegger. I think that the moment we accept, we formulate the problem the way it is usually formulated, like modern technology brings danger. So where should we set up a limit so that we don't go too far? Stem cells, yes and no. Atomic energy, yes and no. We are already within the technological domain. Here I agree that the problem is the very fundamental technological attitude. But the problem I see with Heidegger, the one that I already mentioned, is, okay, now a bit of irony, I think the good implicit criticism of Heidegger, we find it in, did you see that, I otherwise despise the guy, but the film is interesting, I'm not sure to pronounce the name correctly, Night Shyamalan, The Village. I find the film more, much more interesting than it may appear. Why? First, back to Heidegger. Uh, the, <coughs> I think that for Heidegger, the problem for me of Heidegger is that 
a first approach to the problem, is that although, how should I put it, uh, although Heidegger is well aware of how the danger of technology, of how there is no way to return to the old notion of the traditional roots, closed world, and so on, of how we must go through technology, experience its horror. Nonetheless, he remains here inconsistent and in a way breaks down, because typically all examples that he gives are precisely examples of this, Schwarzwald, Schwarz, Schwarzwald, Roots, and so on and so on. No wonder then that this gets even a comical uh, form in some of American pragmatic Heideggerians, like Hubert Dreyfus, who says the way we can resist technology is just to do not get too over-functionalized to retain in everyday life this opening for everyday pleasures. You meet in the evening with friends, get a drink, enjoy a sunset, and so on, as if this escapes, this met written. But from true Heidegger's point, the tragedy is precisely that you do it how? Through a tourist agency and so on, you know that precisely, how to put it, you don't, Heidegger himself provides a good form <coughs> where he says, even alone, uh, how do you call it, the forest man, the for, uh, what was, who is screwing Lady Chatterley, the forest man, okay, even if that guy walks alone in the forest, as authentic as he is, it's already a moment of modern technological machinery. So the way is not to look for the non-mediated authentic remainders. Here, I think Heidegger was right in his Nazi engagement. The moment of truth in it was that he saw it correctly that the way is to embrace to the end technological engagement. And I think that, if anything, the true falsity is the later Heidegger. Why? Uh, one of the best English Heideggerians for me would have been Michel de, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce the name correctly, Michel de Beistegui. But it, there is one detail that I don't quite understand, uh, that I don't quite agree with in his book, The New Heidegger, where on the one, there, he says two things, and I think the truth would have, been, would have been to bring these two things together. One statement very nice by him is how uh, the ambiguity of Heidegger's attachment to Nazism. That, of course, he was sincerely disappointed by Nazism. But to the end, not only in private letters, in publicly, the Nazism was for Heidegger failed, but it was the only authentic attempt to, to confront modernity, the danger of modernity, through a political movement. Which is why, as Michel de Vestigui talks about, to the end he referred to it as the Bewegung, the movement, as it needs no qualification. That was the only attempt. Of course, it miserably failed. But for Heidegger, this failure was the failure of politics as such. He never entertained, you know, it, it is as if, Heidegger's withdrawal later from political engagement was a kind of a negative fidelity to Nazism. I screwed it up there, okay, but that's it. You won't get, you know, like as if that was it and as if to, to try it at another engagement would, would, would betray it. Which is why I think that when Michel de Bestegui then reads Heidegger's later withdrawal from politics as too positive, as Heidegger did try later to uh, uh, got the lesson, political engagement, cannot, uh, that Heidegger didn't want to burn his fingers again. But I think not wanting to burn his fingers again was exactly Heidegger's negative way of kind of a negative fidelity. You know, it's as if, sorry for the tasteless metaphor, but my nature is tasteless. You have an affair, it get, turns out bad, the woman is evil, and then you say, never again another woman. But this is your negative transcript, it's exactly the same to the end with Heidegger. Which is why, for example, people didn't notice this, as I emphasize in my books, Heidegger to the end is the inner greatness of Nazism. Okay, but he never wrote about inner greatness. Okay, it's interesting here, what is Heidegger's hierarchy? Potentially there are some passages which can be determined as, read as inner greatness of Bolshevism. But never inner greatness of liberal democracy, no? 
Sorry? Sorry, sorry, please, uh, I don't understand this. Can you put it more loudly? Because towards the end, he consistently maintains the, the phrase used of the inner greatness of, of national socialism. That phrase only occurs in the Rector Ross Raider, the Rector's address of uh, 1933. 33, yeah? Yeah, he, he didn't retract it later. Sorry, he didn't what? He retracted that he, he changed his mind so quickly. I know he was very dangerous. With inner greatness. The, yeah, the interview in the screen. No, 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 wait a minute. I did my homework here. I know it up to the detail. Not only he rejected it. I know, I just don't want to lose too much time here. I know in detail how it was. In introduction to metaphysics, I'm feeling the metaphysics, you have only the phrase inner greatness. Then, when the book was reprinted in, I think, 53, he added, it's the famous inserted passage, uh, the encounter between modern man and technology. Here, of course, Heidegger cheats. Cheats in what sense? Because uh, he, as it was discovered, he if you compare it with first printing, he qualified it in a way which says, to cut a long story short, exactly the opposite of what he meant. Because it is clear from his other text from that period that what Heidegger, Heidegger's political project in early 30s was that Nazism is a way to not escape, but through accepting it and moving through it to overcome the nihilism in inherent in modern metaphysics. And it's interesting how even in the late 30s, in the early 40s, when he criticizes Hitler and Mussolini, it's in a very ambiguous way. He says, the only two politicians who clearly see the task, this is 38, 39, of fighting nihilism today are Hitler and Mussolini, but even they don't do radically enough because Although they refer to Nietzsche, they didn't study Nietzsche in detail enough, which is incidentally a little bit ridiculous, as if, you know, they should only read Nietzsche. But what I'm saying is that to the, so later it seemed as if the Nazism, the greatness of Nazism is simply that it heroically fully assumed the nihilism. But again, this is not what Heidegger meant in, in early 30s. It was not only assuming the nihilism, it was that, to cut a long story short, that it already is the new beginning the breakout, through fully assuming. I see. So I know here the story in detail, and uh, again, what I'm saying is that at least till 45 and later, you always have this kind of, a how should I put it, bitterness. All I'm saying is the following thing. You know, one of the best, we don't have time to go into it for me, uh, Chesterton's short stories. It's, I think, the sign of the broken sword. It's really a wonderful story. Incidentally, a very nice critique of English imperialism. It's a fictional account of a monument to a British general in Brazil, Jungle, who was defeated uh, by local insurgents, their anti-colonialists, and was then hanged brutally, and his broken sword was found there, something like that, whatever. So uh, then Father Brown, it's a historical case, a little bit like Josephine Tay's The Daughter of Town, uh, Time. Father Brown confronts the problem and asks, says, there is something fishy here. Two things do not fit the image. First, the British general died in the most nonsensical attack. The, this general was well known as very cautious strategist. Why did he attack the Brazilian rebel army in this crazy way? Because it was known from history, this fictional history, that the, the British general attacked it in a way totally out of totally strange to his usual mode. And he could have even defeated maybe the Brazilians without. Second thing, why was he hanged afterwards? The Brazilian rebel general, anti-colonialist, is portrayed, this is fiction, but it's nice, by uh, Chesterton as very generous and so on. It's totally, and then he reconstructs wonderfully the case that this English general, the hero, there are statues of him, kind of a Gordon, if Gordon Square, we are a Gordon figure, of course, is, was evil, totally corrupted. And it's, here you have Chesterton. He says, what's the cause of it? Not, he didn't read Bible enough. He said, he read Bible too much. Ain't it nice for a Catholic to say, no? <laughs> Did he read Bible too much? And so on. In, okay, that's better. Let's go on. So, uh, ah, even nicer anti-dogmatic rule. He says, he read too much his Bible, he forgot to read the way other people read the Bible. Very nice formula. Okay, so 
we gaan hier niet constructen de essay. Sorry, the, what really happened is this is the official meet. The, you know, like another how do you call that attack on the in, Indian brigade, another great fiasco in Afghanistan or wait, of that light brigade, charge of the light brigade. No, that the meet was heroically Englishmen attacking, outnumbered and heroically died, and then cruelly the survivors thanked. No, his reconstruction of Father Brown is the following one. Just before the battle, the general was confronted by one of his honest, who is an Irishman, honest because, you know, Chesterton was playing his own cards, honest Catholic and so on, uh, uh, sub-commanders accusing him of, since by chance this, his second in charge learned of uh, general's corruption, stealing diamonds, whatever. Then, in a bit of fury, while they were talking, uh, walking and talking close to a river, the general stabbed him. And then he quickly overviewed the situation. Other soldiers were here, how to escape being detected. And then you have this wonderful saying, what is the be best way to, to hide a tree in a forest? So what is the best way to hide a corpse in a multitude of corpses? So he organized this crazy attack just to create as many deaths as possible so that this corpse would have been lost there. And why was he caned? Then the idea is that the noble Brazilian anti-colonialist leader, general, sets him free, but the other surviving Englishmen hang him, but swear not to disturb the glory of... It's a little bit like John Ford, Fort Apache conclusion, you know. Public image, let's stay by private lips. So the idea is you do a big crime to cover a small crime, no? You know, like a friend of mine was doing this, I'm sorry to, but it's the logic. When I was young, I remember a friend of mine was sexually very promiscuous and he organized once, he wanted to organize a big public orgy, you know. I screw you, you screw her, the whole complicated exchange of partners till we got it. She just wanted to screw one particular woman, no? <laughs> to cover that was I screw you, you screw her, and so on, no? You know, this, uh, it's the, basically Agatha Christie, the ABC murders, no? So, you know, that uh, you kill one, but to erase the trace, you kill more so that people would look for some deep hermeneutical clue or whatever. And the, uh, what I'm saying is that there is something of this in Heidegger, you know? There was one crime, no? Nazism, and then he had to do, uh, he had to universalize it in a way. But, uh, nonetheless, let us go on now. Nonetheless, uh, yes, sorry, let's go on. So, where Heidegger that isn't radical enough, I think, is in this, here he doesn't go far enough in the direction of terror. Heidegger remains, for him, the basic attitude is still, technological, okay, he doesn't use the term alienation, but that life world, life world, the ultimate reference remains this ordinary, everyday opening of the world, life world, everyday experience. And again, science through its objectivization, changing, uh, changing us into uh, objects of technological and so on and so on. But as I, try, as I tried to demonstrate here, I think it was precisely in that talk, which was not for which was just, which was a public talk, which means less people than here. I think that the lesson to be taken from the, the true tragedy of our predicament with regard to technology is that I agree with critiques of technology that in the face of ecological crisis, technology as such cannot save us, that the technology technology mechanisms of avoiding the risk, taking risk into account, cautionary principle, etc., don't work. But I think the true tragedy, as I tried to develop, some of you who were here remember it, is that we have also, at the same time, to radically cut our roots, our ground, in this embeddedment in everyday life experience, which is so much favored by all these neo heideggerian philosophers and so on. Because I think that the true the worst, what really makes us blind for the ecological threat of technology is precisely the combination of the two. That is to say, is how, while being in, engaged in science, we somehow rely unproblematically that the life world remains here. 
like the way I described in that public talk where most of you were not here, <laughs> although in this very room, how, uh, <laughs> for example, Chernobyl, I referred here to the French theorist Jean-Pierre Dupuy, Chernobyl, it was a catastrophe, or when people say global warming, but then our everyday life world experience is precisely what prevents us phenomenologically, as it were, to take the catastrophe seriously. It's, okay, we talk here about the end of the world, uh, the day after, you know that woman film by Wolfgang Petersen, the day, or it's too, uh, yeah, the, the day after where, I mean, if nothing else, I like that film for one scene. You remember when <laughs> Americans are waiting to enter Mexico for visas and so on. No, if nothing else, else I like that. But, okay, what I'm saying is that then we go out and admit it. You see out the sun, the grass, and you say, fuck it, but this cannot disappear. This is precisely because it is the presupposed life world. You cannot really get out of it. It's what late Wittgenstein would have called certainty. This fundamental background certainty. And I think the tragedy of scientists is that not that they are not attached to this life world, but that they are. Uh, a French uh, philosopher, Louis Dumont, deployed this, in a very nice, convincing way, this paradox of cognitivist reductionism. For cognitivists, in their naive ideology, through biogenetic and other cognitivist manipulations, man will finally become master of himself, recreating his own genome and so on. <coughs> but you see what's the catch here? The catch is, if I become fully an object to myself, but who is then the myself for whom I am an object? You get my point? It's, no matter how much I manipulate, I presuppose for myself that I remain myself out there freely manipulating. But if I'm fully to become an object of manipulation, that agency itself precisely disappears. That's the problem of scientists, that they, they remain too much. So I think that I, one, here we should go even one step further from Heidegger. We should, this is the horror, where I refer to Heidegger, to Hegel, the horror that we have to accept is to really accept the abyss, to cut our links even, we have to unlearn in order to survive, our most elementary roots in life world and so on and so on. Where does here come uh, Shyamalan village? You know what it is, it's a nice movie. It's the tale of a Pennsylvania village cut off from the rest of the world, surrounded by woods, full of dangerous monsters and boogeymen known to the villagers as those we don't speak of. Most villagers are content to live <coughs> with the bargain they made with these creatures. They don't enter the forest, the creatures don't enter the town. <coughs> now, conflict arises when a young member of the village, Lucius Hunt, wishes to leave the village in search of new medicines. And the pact is broken. Lucius and Ivy Walker, the village leader's blind daughter, decide to get married, which makes the village idiot jealous. He steps Lucius, nearly kills him. So then, what happens then? Then Ivy's father, the village leader, played by William Hurt, tells her about the town's secret. You think two-thirds of the feeling that we are somewhere in the late 19th century provincial United States. Then you learn what is effectively happening. We live today, 2001, two, whatever, there are no monsters. The village is simply what was constructed by the town elders, a narrow group of seven, eight key people who were part of the 20th century crime victims support group. And they simply despaired at the world outside. A couple of them were billionaires. So what they did is they said, let us recreate the last period that they perceived as the period of golden age of United States, this democratic, and there is even a socialist aspect to it, the, namely this utopian, proto-socialist, New England, authentic communities, small towns. So the way they did it is they bought a large piece of land. Then, since they were billionaires, they, they, did, they constructed a protective wall. They employed policemen through lawyers. The, to, they even bribed the air authorities so that no planes are seen above and they simply live all the time there with no, and to scare 
the youngsters or those who are not initiated, they themselves dress up into these monsters to scare young people to exit. And the, the, uh, the end of the film repeats this tragic closure. The young Ivy goes out, gets the medicines, returns back, and the father tells her, now you must choose. Will you play with in? And she says, yes, so they continue the, they continue the, okay. they continue the deception. Now, usually the film is dismissed as creating, uh, 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 kind of playing on these fears of protection of children, creating an enclosed space, and so on and so on. But I think that, my God, the film is more, much more ambiguous than it may appear. First, isn't rather the lesson, and with this lesson I wholly agree. The lesson of the film for me is the true evil of our societies. It's not the capitalist dynamic as such but precisely the attempts to extricate ourselves from these dynamics while profiting from it to carve our self-enclosed self communal spaces, gated, this is the ultimate gated community. I think, and the tragic lesson of the film is, it's not a, is that in order to have a gated community, first, you have to be extra billionaire exploited. Point two, you have to have an enlightened dictatorship. Even more interesting, point three, you have to construct your own mythical fears to fight. You know that it's not enough to live happily there. You have to construct your own monsters. So I think, again, that maybe even if it's not planned, but it's a much more interesting, ambiguous message. I think it's a rather terrifying message of how any withdrawal into authentic communities today, it's a total fake. It's a fake which has to generate its own mythology uh, and so on and so on. Here, again, uh, I'm not totally condemning when Heidegger says open ourselves to the experience of the world, the mystery of world as endangered by modern technology. Uh, the first thing to do, even if we accept Heidegger's program, is to look for it, not in Schwar stupid Schwarzwald villages and so on and so on, but <coughs> let me just name two writers, both detective writers, one contemporary, the other little, Philip Marlowe, Ruth Rendell. Why do I like them? Because isn't it that what, I mean, the idea came to me when I read Frederick Jameson's famous essay on Chandler, where he says that Chandler has to be read to the Heideggerian writer. That is to say that it's as if California, he describes, is torn between this Heideggerian earth, inertia, desert, and opening sky, whatever. That is to say, isn't it that true? This is, uh, for me, Marlowe, sorry, Chandler novels of Philip Marlowe and Ruth Rendell's best works is an example of opening a world in the sense of rediscovering as a uh, the poetic dimension, not in some stupid Schwarzwald villages where farmers are screwing their goats in the evenings or whatever, but precisely in the most destitute modern world. You know, every idiot can discover a poetic potential in a Schwarzwald hut there. It's much more difficult what Ruth Rendell does to discover poetic potential, and I always like it, you know, when you reproach London from south or east, it's on a train. All the backsides of buildings, all those disgusting uh, gardens behind the houses with, you know, all the rotten things, half in decay, uh, uh, buildings taken over by nature, discover a poetry, a poetry in that. So here, yes, but nonetheless, I think that this is not enough in the sense that we have to accept this terror of worldlessness, that we effectively lose our fundamental roots. That's our only solution. And here I think Heidegger doesn't go far enough. So let me conclude for today and announce just the topic for today. If the bad guys, the danger, the politics of fear today is biopolitics as protecting us, playing on the fears. We protect you from fear, safety, gated communities against victimization. What would be the opposite? Next time I will talk about it. If you don't know you are lost. The opposite is the dictatorship of the proletariat. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Tuesday, no